Hey, what's up guys? I'm Evan and today we're going to be looking at how to build a website with React Native. I'm so excited to finally show you guys this stuff. So we've got right here on the right is an app. This is the uh, the Expo template tabs application. So we can click between the tabs and we can scroll around, we can click buttons and you get the idea. There's navigation, there's pages, it's a native app. And then over here on the left, we have the same app using the exact same code base running in the browser very performantly too, I might add. I don't know if that's a word. Over here, you're going to notice that the title of the video <laughs> You're going to notice that the title of the tab is set to the title of the application. You're also going to notice that the uh, the URL bar is changing when we click between the tabs. So when we navigate, it automatically builds those pages for us. That's using a hash router from the history API. Same thing as like reach router and react router and other router and other router. This will apply to almost any of your projects that have the same uh, co-operability between native and web. Uh, I've been working really hard to make sure that <laughs> to make sure that everything works across native and web as closely as possible. Now, of course, this is using React Native for Web. If you're not familiar with React Native for Web, it was made by Nick Gallagher for the Twitter Lite PWA. And at this point, a lot of Twitter is now written in React Native for Web. So if we pop this bad boy open, the inspector, and we take a look at the um, the elements, you're gonna notice these, uh, these CSS prefixes right here. That's part of the atomic CSS styling that Twitter uses. So if I come over to Twitter and I pop open their inspection, you're gonna notice that it's also going to have those same CSS prefixes if I inspect around some things. Notice the CSX prefix. But what's really great about React Native for Web is that they actually ship that same code to the Twitter website. So this is very performant stuff. It's really good. The reason I say that is because the name React Native for Web is not a great name. It kind of insinuates that we took React, made it work natively, and then we took that native thing and made it work back on the web. When in reality, all we're doing is creating primitives, things like view and image and text, and then those bind to div and span. And uh, so what you're left with is a very performant website. Uh, and of course, Twitter's not the only one who uses this. It's also used by Uber and Flipkart and Wall Street Journal, uh, maybe, and New York Times and Major League Soccer. I missed my own finger just then. I'm really bad at hand-eye coordination. Now, Expo's actual support for web is something that I've been working on. It's in early beta right now as of SDK 33. And of course, this means that going forward, Expo officially now supports iOS, Android, and web. So it's a tri-platform system. This last performance thing I wanted to show you probably won't work, but we're gonna try it anyways. So I've gone to this website. This is just the blank Expo project, which I then posted to Netlify after bundling. And now I'm going to open up Lighthouse, the audits tab. If you're not familiar with web, Lighthouse is used for profiling, kind of in a general sense, how a, a website functions very very well very very well now there's a reason we didn't get a hundred across all of these excuses time with evan excuse number one i'm not running in incognito mode i've got a ton of extensions up over here so those all you know do some extra blah 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 and then um i'm filming a video there's a good excuse as well outside of that though you don't get if you were to take a blank index.html and post it in a web browser you're not going to get 100 in accessibility best practice seo or pwa and you're getting 100 across the board meaning that there's a lot of magic going on behind the scenes to make sure you're getting that now with that long-winded description out of the way let's bootstrap an app so the first thing you're going to want to make sure you do is install the latest version of Expo CLI. You can do that with npm install dash g Expo CLI. Cool work. The next thing you're going to want to do is actually make an app. And now this is going to be very different from how you do it natively in the sense that it's not different at all. It's completely the same. So just do Expo init and you can bootstrap your React Native and web application. It's going to ask you which template you want to go with. For this project, we're using the tabs template. Then it's going to ask for the name of that project and the slug. For this, we're going to do um, just put in any name at random. Then go ahead and hit yes or whatever to use Yarn to install your libraries. Again, this is the same as bootstrapping any Expo project, minus the name part. I might get in trouble for that part, but I also might not. All right, after it's completed generating your project, just CD into the project, CD. And then you can run yarn start to, to actually get this party of rolling or expo start, which is really what yarn start is bound to. Pretend you didn't see that, that message because I quit out of the npm install thing. 
All right, after your project is fully started up, you're gonna get this prompt. Now from here, you can hit A to start it in Android, I to start it in iOS, or W to start it on web. So let's go ahead and start it on web. Once we do that, it's going to fire up Webpack. It's because we have two projects running, it's gonna ask if we wanna use a new port or the old port. So at this point, when Webpack is finished firing up, what's going to happen is it's going to show you this prompt, which is very similar to the Create React App prompt. In fact, it's identical. That was just to make sure it was familiar for people coming from whichever background you're coming from. And if I hit I, it's going to open it up over here in the iOS simulator. Now, we don't really need the iOS simulator. I was just kind of flexing how it works the same everywhere. So we're gonna go ahead and get rid of that, except no, we aren't. I'm just gonna pull that right back show you guys something here really quick. So you'll notice if we bounce around between the tabs that the URL bar up here is not changing at all. That's because we're using the native uh, linking system. So we need to have platform specific code for that part, which pulls in browser support specifically for web. You can do that with Yarn Add React Navigation Web or NPM install React Navigation Web. Once that's in finished installing, we're going to open up our project. I'm actually opening up to the older project that we were looking at at the beginning of the video. Remember hours ago at the beginning of the video? To do this specific browser navigation, what we want to do is pull in Create Browser App from React Navigation Web. If you're not familiar with React Navigation, I've got some great videos on it that you can watch. I'm not going to put them here but you can find them. Now, with React Navigation, you always wrap the topmost navigator with create app container. Now, in the browser, we wanna wrap it and create browser app from React Navigation Web. Now, we want to switch based off of which platform we're running on. So we're also going to import platform from React Native. Now, we're gonna use platform.select, which is a function, and it will say that uh, if we're doing one platform, use A, and if we're using the other platform, use B. So in this case, we only want to use create browser app on web. So we're gonna add the web key, and then we're going to add a function which uses create browser app. We're gonna pass in our configuration, and then we're gonna do the history hash part, which I'm gonna to get to here in a second. And then for default, basically, for iOS, Android, and any other platform, we want to use create app container. So we can use the, we can either do iOS and Android, or we could do the default thing. I like the default thing. Now we can use create app, and we can wrap our function in create app, which will of course render us this awesome navigation system where the URL bar changes, and we can use the native navigation controls to bounce back and forth between them, and if we pass props in, they'll also show up in the URL bar. Now, like I said, we have this history hash thing here. So in web navigation, there's a library called history. Now history is kind of what everyone uses to do their navigation in JavaScript, but a quick disclaimer, I don't know what I'm talking about. The default history here is browser history. Now that's pretty good for SSR or server side rendering. Which is a complex topic that has its own set of benefits and drawbacks. It didn't work, which it probably won't work. And we will not be using it in this tutorial. So what we're going to use is the hash history type. So you can pass in a history object here or you can just pass in the name of the type of hash we want to use. So the type of history we want to use. In this case, it's going to be hash. And you could also pass in browser. What the hash is going to do is it means that you don't have to do any extra setup. You're going to get that navigation built in automatically. So now that we have this app and we have history working in it, let's actually push it onto the internet so that people can use it. The way we're going to do that is with the Expo CLI. So to put code on the internet, we need to create a static bundle first. So we need something called a bundler, which Webpack is going to do. So we have a convenience command wrapped around it, and it's a lot of convenience, so I'm not really gonna get too into what it's doing, but if you run expo build web, it will create that static bundle and you can put it on the internet. So let's go ahead and do that right now. We'll do expo build web with the expo CLI in that project that we just created. Now this is going to take a few seconds. The reason for that is because uh, what it's doing is it's looking at all of the code that we have here, and we have a ton of code here, and anything that's not being used, Webpack is going through and it's meticulously removing any of that extra code, which is why we're able to get such great performance. So, for instance, if you're not using Scroll View from React Native, it will remove Scroll View from React Native, or if you're not using Flatlist, Flatlist won't be in your bundle. And same with any of the Expo APIs or any of the node modules that you install and don't end up using. It takes a few seconds to run through all of the code and then after it's done with that, it converts it to common JS code so that you can run it in lots of different kinds of browsers. 
And then the last thing that it does when it gets right up here to the 90%-ish area is it's going through a PWA phase. Now, if you're not familiar with PWA, that's a progressive web app. Progressive web apps are kind of tedious to make because they don't really function nearly as good as native apps and they are slightly more involved than websites. What we're able to do now that we have an app and a website built with the same code base is interpolate that PWA. So that's what's happening right here at the end. It's going through and it's generating all of the splash screens, the icons, the metadata required, and the service worker so that you can get perfect scores on your PWA and anyone can install your website to use offline later, which uh, users love. So you're gonna seem really professional, even though you're probably like me and have no idea what you're doing. Okay, so at this point it's finished building, which means that we now have this web build folder. This is a folder with all of our static files in it. And if you were to go dig through them, like for instance, the icons, you'll notice we have all the icons for our PWA and the splash screens for our PWA so that there's always something that renders when we open the PWA and then when it's in the multitasker. So now to actually put this on the internet, you can use a variety of options, but I'm going to use this one today. I'm gonna go ahead and do that by typing Netlify deploy. You just install the Netlify CLI by npm install Netlify sub. But what I love about this is that it's free and it's very easy. You do Netlify deploy, create and configure a new website. Dang it, that one was taken. And for the deploy path, just point to that web build folder. So web build, which will render you a live draft URL. And just like that, we are now playing with our website on the internet. The link for this Fantastic. website will be in the description below. And if you want to get not the hash thing, you can just do dash dash prod, push that bad boy to prod. And now I can go to jsurrisurrisucks.netlify.com and hit my dope website. Anyways, guys, that's it. Four step process that I explained in 30 minutes, very long winded, but it's super simple to use. Update to SDK 33 and give it a shot. Send me links to the websites that you make. I'd love to see them and help you guys make them better. Uh, if you find any bugs, feel free to report them. Comments below, GitHub above, and Twitter, Bacon Bricks. And uh, I will see you in the next video.